Zoom recording. Okay, good. Um, so we'll get started here. There's a whole lot to cover. Um, it, it's really important uh, as we get into um, the process of um, interpreting the imagery, analyzing the imagery, and, and putting out recommendations and conclusions. It's really important that anyone involved with the data for this project understand um, the broader concepts of remote sensing, the limitations uh, in it, um, and, and the principles involved. So um, some people might think of image interpretation as just tracing lines and colors that you can see in an image. Um, but you really have to understand those foundations um, to help you through some of the more complicated parts of image interpretation. So that's what we're really getting at today, um, since everyone that's on this line will be dealing with the data in one way or another at some point. Um, there's a lot of content to cover today, and a lot of it will probably be new um, if you've not done a lot of image analysis before. And that's okay. So, you know, this this will be recorded. This is a reference that you can use. And there's just a, an enormous body of knowledge and educational material out there. Um, and me, too, if, if you're having trouble with any of this information. So with that, I'm going to get started. We did our welcome. Um, next, I'm going to just do a um, 15 minute or so uh, project overview and update for the work that was um, just done over the last couple months for the PSM project. Then we're going to really get into the remote sensing stuff, um, cra a crash course in remote sensing and some of those broader principles. And then really get into, we'll spend the majority of that time talking specifically about eelgrass mapping principles and practices. And we'll have examples and demonstrations and some hands on stuff there as well. We have two hours total. So it's a lot to cram into two hours. People spend their whole careers learning this stuff and, <laughs> you know, go through eight years of academics to, to learn it too. So it's really just supposed to be a, a broader um, introduction. So remember that with remote sensing, um, we're relying on on data um, that's collected from sources other than our eyeballs in remote sensing. So we're relying on satellite imagery, airplane imagery, drone and boat-based imagery um, to reduce the burden on us as humans to have to go out and collect all that data just with our eyeballs. So um, when we rely on those types of data, there's gonna be limitations. And the problem with eelgrass mapping is that we rely on these types of data, but we don't fully understand their limitations. Um, we do know that the higher in elevation you collect imagery, you tend to get higher spatial coverage. So for example, a satellite image covers a whole lot of area, but you tend to get a lower level of detail. So we know that. Um, and on the opposite end of that spectrum, we know with a drone or sonar, you cover a much smaller area, but you can get a lot higher detail. And then, of course, the gold standard sort of being divers, you know, human eyes observing um, reality on the ground, the, uh, the gold standard. And um, sort of the goal of the PSM project is to better understand the limitations of each one of these data sources as it pertains specifically to eelgrass mapping, since there is such a high reliance on these different methods. So the objectives of, um, of the PSM project, which um, is a project of special merit, NOAA funded project, is to assess detection capabilities using satellites, airplanes, drones, and sonar, and to compare those against that gold standard of diver surveys. To establish a process for integrating eelgrass maps derived from the different techniques. So currently, if you draw an eelgrass um, polygon using an aerial image, like how DEP does, and then you try to somehow match that up with side scan sonar survey, there's no process in place yet that lets you easily sort of combine or mesh those two different data types together, just because we don't understand their limitations very well. Just give me one second. I'm just going to change my control screen here. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, yep. So this is to help us better understand um, the limitations and the performance of each method. And we're hoping that that will um, lead to more informed project siting. So if there's a dredge project, a dock and pier, 
you know, some in water um, construction project that we can better, um, better cite those activities uh, with better survey data and lead to better resource management ultimately. We're gonna generate map products um, showing updated eelgrass estimates for our study sites. And that can have a broader utility too. This could help inform um, eelgrass maps across the entire state. We hope that it does. Um, and also inform things that are calculated from the eelgrass maps, such as you know, blue carbon storage and things like that. And increase capacity among um, partners and others to, to do this kind of work and also awareness among industry. So, you know, in project review, if a consultant goes out and, and does a survey, um, you know, to, to support a project, construction project, we want them to actually understand the limitations of, of the survey that they're, um, that they're conducting. This is, um, we're, I'm gonna give an, a, a, a brief overview of the approach we're taking in this project. Most of the partners are, are well aware um, of this, uh, but for those that are new to this, um, we conducted our surveys at five sites in Massachusetts. Um, those are shown here with the red stars. So mostly on the, the North Shore um, of Massachusetts, Massachusetts with one site south of Boston and Cohasset Outer Harbor. <laughs> Um, at each of those five sites, all five survey methods plus ground truthing were conducted concurrently within the same three week period, which was in um, June to July, 2022. And at each site, there were two shallow and one deep edge diver transects. And this is just a, a very rough approximation of that. Um, the analysis approach is image interpretation by trained staff and interns or, or grad students at um, NGO partner organizations, that's you all. And then when your interpretation is done, those interpreted polygons are gonna be compared against the diver measured edges. So that difference between where you detected eelgrass and where the diver found eelgrass is going to be um, sort of the deviation or the error for that mapping method. And we're hoping from those data to create some appropriate buffers around, for example, you know, if we find that satellite imagery misses eelgrass by some distance, that might be an appropriate buffer to apply anytime we're using satellite imagery to map eelgrass. And then the, um, the detection error will be determined for different eelgrass densities or percent covers. That's gonna be using the, um, the ground truthing point data. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that a little bit more in a, in a minute. And then the diver quadrat data are going to be used to provide context for, um, for why eelgrass may or may not have been detectable in certain uh, data sets. So things like the shoot height, you know, if, if grass is very tall, it might be more detectable than when it's very small. Same with patchiness, if it's very dense and continuous, uh, we are more likely to see it in the imagery, um, most likely. And if it's very sparse and you know a shoot here and a shoot there, it's, it's probably less likely to see in the imagery. So those are the sorts of um, steps we'll take in analysis. The status of the data right now, um, this is our very busy calendar from June um, to, ju to July. Uh, everything that you see here is color coded by survey type and these were all completed. So these are all the completed surveys for the project. Um, the bulk of the work was conducted um, in the dates that you see boxed in black. Uh, so we stayed within that. Um, we were aiming for two weeks, but okay with three weeks. So we, we got all uh, almost all imagery and data collected within th a three week period, but there were some um, that ended up having to fall outside of that. And that's something we need to um, just evaluate and, um, and document in our reporting. So for example, there, we had to use imagery, satellite imagery from much earlier in the period, you know, June 5th, um, just because there wasn't any good cloudless satellite imagery for Gloucester um, during our, our desired period. But I'm, I'm very happy with how this worked out. We did end up um, getting the bulk of the work done where we intended to. I also wanted to let you all know that there's a, a new story map launched for the project. Um, this was largely with the help of CZM's outreach and communications team. They did such an awesome job and the link is there. It's got cool um, field photos and videos and things like that in it that I don't, I don't have time to go through today, but thought you might be interested in checking that out. 
So now I'm going to get into an overview of the data types that were collected with a little more information and context about those for you. Um, Got too many screens open. Here we go. Um, so satellite imagery, um, I was the one to procure that. I, I did that through Planet, which is um, an imagery producer and provider. They have a whole bunch of satellites out there up in space um, and a really nice platform for querying and purchasing their imagery. I also was able to tap into a nice um, agreement with NASA that any federally funded research project can go through an application process to, to get imagery for free. So I was able to do that and save thousands um, for the project, which is nice. Um, the imagery is from, they have lots of different types of satellites and the free imagery I was able to use was their SuperDove satellite, which is pictured on the bottom left. That makes it, that picture makes it look very large, but it's actually the size of about a shoebox. Um, the picture on the right. So these are very small satellites. They put them up in space in what's called flocks. So they'll just launch, you know, hundreds of them up into space and they're um, collecting imagery every day. These satellites uh, pass over our area. One of them is passing over our area almost every single day uh, at about the same time every day. So it's really neat. Once they're in orbit, they just keep going until they die or get, um, you know, knocked out of orbit and destroyed. So um, it's a really great tool. This is amazing, an amazing resource for researchers in general, which is why I wanted to, to spend the time sharing that with you. Um, the pixel resolution is pretty good. It's three meter um, pixel resolution. I'll, I'm going to describe in a, in a couple minutes exactly what that means, but that's pretty good. Other free data sets out there like Landsat um, are 15 or 30 meters. So they're, they're great for tracking like global changes, but really you're not going to use those data sets for, for eelgrass mapping. So I was able to get imagery for all five of our sites from the date, the three dates uh, shown there. And Northeastern, Randall's, Randall and her team are gonna be um, interpreting those images. The aerial survey done by airplane that was led by MassDEP. And that flight was conducted on July 1st. That's um, really nice high resolution imagery, a quarter meter. Um, DEP has their own contractors who processed and corrected the imagery and, and it turned um, turned in, into nice ortho mosaics. So that's you know corrected for location um, and put in the in an accurate location on the map. That's what that means to to geo rectify something. And Sarah's team, um, Sarah and Taylor, are, go are going to be processing those imagery. The drone work was led by me and Julie. And um, we had a whole lot of flights. We had eight flights carried out over six days on a variety of um, you know, weather and tide and um, gear situations to deal with. It was a, a very interesting process. You can't see it there, but we're, where we're kneeling, we have a little drone right between us there from a flight we did in, in Beverly. This is um, super high resolution imagery, less than three centimeters per pixel. So you're getting extreme detail there. Um, and the image processing is done in drone deploy software. So that's a proprietary um, paid for software that does a really nice job of taking all the individual little pictures and um, stitching them all together into a nice uh, ortho mosaic. And that analysis is going to be done by Julie and her student. The side scan sonar was led by DMF. Um, that's Steve Voss there uh, captaining the boat. And that work was completed over three long field days. Iris was out there with us for, for most of those two. Um, and that was done in a, a mow the lawn pattern. So that's where you're really doing parallel um, adjacent lines. The sketch on the left is, is really extremely rough. The lines were <laughs> much cleaner than that. Um, but we generally covered, we mowed the lawn uh, over the entire meadow, kind of with the, what you see in the yellow line. And then in the vicinity of the diver transects, we, um, we went over it a bunch of times from different directions. So we have really high data density there, something like two or 300% data coverage, just to make sure we've accounted for like the lean of the eelgrass, if there's a current, um, we mapped it from a bunch of different directions. The processing of that data is done in Sonar TRX. That's another proprietary software. Um, and Steve did all of that. And the analysis of that data will be the South Sound Coast Watch team. 
photo ground truthing was completed on the sonar days. Um, and that involved intensive randomized sampling in the vicinity of the diver transects. So the bottom image um, is a demonstration of that. Uh, the yellow line being a diver transect and all those triangles being uh, where the drop frame was lowered into the water. Um, and then uh, on the surface, we were um, categorizing the eelgrass percent cover in 10% bins, and those bins are shown here too. And that's to help us get at um, the changes in, in bed density or percent cover along that gradient. So we were hoping to see sort of what's depicted here in the image where you can see the change from dense grass to more sparse to um, absent or extremely low density. There's a lot of these data points. There were 30 drops per diver transect. So 90 per site, which ended up being whatever that is, um, 450 total for the project. So it's a pretty good data set there. And then the diver data, um, all those surveys were completed over five days um, from June 21st to 30th. Uh, we did have to redo one transect that was just the location was a little bit off um, and that was done in mid-July. But again, uh, we feel good about that. Almost all the data were done in that, in that window we were uh, aiming for. And what that entailed um, was the divers swimming. Uh, we planned for anywhere from 50 to 100 meters along the edge of the bed, swimming perpendicular to shore. They would start in a location that Tay and I pre-selected based on um, ortho imagery and, and what we were seeing in available um, satellite imagery. Uh, and then that was field um, verified before the dive. So we would put a camera in the water, make sure that that was a good starting point. Um, and then the divers would start there, swim perpendicular to shore and find the last shoot of eelgrass. Um, there, I, I'm not aware of any work that's ever been done before to, to look for the last shoot. So we sort of invented our own method here, which involved um, the divers swimming until they thought they found the last shoot and then swimming another 20 meters to ensure it was the last one. Uh, and if they found nothing, then they would come back to that last shoot and that would be the last one. Then they would go back along, in addition to the measurement of the last, the distance to the last shoot, they would go back and um, drop quadrats along the transect. Um, measure, they did 13 total. And in each quadrat, they would measure eelgrass percent cover, the patchiness of the meadow in that location, canopy height, if there were al was algae present, collect a photo. Um, and then at top side, we would get the coordinates for both ends of the transect and a secchi depth. So um, I'll just stop there briefly and ask if anybody has any broader questions about the methods of the study before we get into really the remote sensing stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, Jill, would you put the um, link to the story map in the chat? Sure. Because I didn't get it. Oh yeah, it was in there pretty quick, huh? Yep. I don't want to exit the slideshow just yet, um, but I'll do that before the end. Or send email it to us. Just wanted sure. to. Great. Yep. Okay. So here we go. <laughs> so crash course in remote sensing. Um, remote sensing is defined as the science and art of acquiring and analyzing information about objects or phenomena from a distance. Um, so you could say that even our eyeballs are remote sensors. However, um, they're not an ideal tool for, um, for most types of monitoring because we can only see visible light. Um, our perspective is limited to where we are and our, the size of our bodies and where we're located. And we can't easily form lasting records of what we're viewing. So humans have always strived to use other tools and other technologies um, to, to do these monitoring activities and um, and observe. There's dozens of different forms of remote sensors. There's visible light sensors. So you can think of those as like cameras that are looking at the visible light spectrum. There's infrared and heat sensors. There's radar, there's sonar, there's just dozens and they're all, um, they're all part of remote sensing. But the concept is all the same. They all involve recording the amount of energy, which could be electromagnetic like light, or acoustic like sound that's emitting or bouncing off of objects. So that principle is uniform across all of the different 
platforms. Uh, there's generally two different kinds of remote sensing, active remote sensing, and that is where the platform is producing uh, an energy, some kind of signal, light or sound, and it's measuring what gets bounced back. So it's actually putting energy out into the world and measuring the return. So other examples of that, there are satellites that do that, for example, like um, uh, radar. Um, other examples are side scan sonar. So it's actually sending a ping of sound out to um, during the survey and measuring the sound that returns back. And even the flash um, in a picture, that's considered active remote sensing. So it's sending light out and measuring the light returned. The other type is passive remote sensing. Most satellites are doing passive remote sensing. So it's measuring um, the light energy, different parts of the light spectrum that are bouncing from the sun to earth and back up. This is also the concept of a regular camera. Um, it's, and also um, forehead thermometers. So it, there's nothing, there's no beam of energy coming out of a forehead thermometer. It's actually measuring the, um, the heat coming off, off of your body and drones. So that's just using an ordinary camera and there's no flash on a drone. It's measuring the light that's already in the ambient environment bouncing up to the camera. Here's where I think this is a very complicated slide, but it's important to see where the different types of energy fall on a spectrum. So electromagnetic radiation is energy that includes both electrical and magnetic waves that propagate through space, lots of different forms. So you might not think in your mind that the visible light we see and radio waves have, any, have anything in common, but they do. They're, they both travel through space in, the, in a wave form um, and they're shown here and they, they exist on the same electromagnetic spectrum. So we can sometimes see electromagnetic radiation as visible light. That's the only part of the spectrum that our, our eyes can see. Um, we can sometimes feel it as warmth or we can be affected by it or harmed by it like X-rays or ultraviolet, ultraviolet rays. Um, some portions of the electromagnetic spectrum are not able to penetrate the atmosphere. So that's indicated by these sort of gray areas. Um, they can't make it through the haze and the clouds and um, the distance of the atmosphere. Um, but you can see that there are these windows that can make it through. So for example, radio waves can make it through the atmosphere. That's why we can have um, very, very powerful radios across the world that we can hear, or you know, on our satellites, we can have radio communication from a satellite to Earth. That's why, um, why we can do that. And then we have this optical window here um, where sunlight can come through um, and make it through the atmosphere. So that includes the visible light that our eyes can see, all the colors of the, the Roy G. Biv um, rainbow colors, and then the colors, uh, the light waves that we can't see. So uh, infrared is invisible to us. Um, these, these early ultraviolet wavelengths are invisible to us, but they can make it through our atmosphere. So that's part of why we wear sunscreen because some ultravi ultraviolet rays can come through even though we can't see them. Um, yes, so the area boxed in red are um, these light forms, these uh, wavelengths are commonly used in remote sensing mapping projects because they can make it through um, the atmosphere and we can easily equip satellites, planes and drones with sensors for these types of wavelengths. So we can put infrared sensors on a, on a drone and ultraviolet sensors. So for example, um, an aircraft might have sensors that can detect three segments or bands of the light spectrum. Uh, it might have a sensor for red light, a sensor for green light, and a sensor for blue light, those being our three primary colors of light. And then the red sensor, for example, would measure the amount of red light that bounces off the earth and reaches the sensor. Same for the blue and green. But then when you take the three bands, so you have the data for the three bands, and then you combine them together, then you can form imagery um, that, very, that looks very much like how our human eyes 
um, can see things because these are the three primary colors of light. So um, when you combine these three bands of imagery together, you get what, what's very normal looking to us or in remote sensing that's called true color, very similar to, to human vision. But then there's other types of bands um, that can be added to, to different sensors. Often, very often, um, infrared sensors are included. They're, they're cheap and they're easy to add and they tell us so much. So even though infrared is invisible to our eyes, um, we can process it using different softwares um, to learn about uh, vegetation monitoring in, in particular, because infrared light interacts with plants in a very unique way. Healthy, robust plants will reflect more infrared than unhealthy plants. So when you're looking at an infrared image, um, the bright red that's standing out is very healthy, very robust vegetation. Then you can see areas where it's maybe sort of mixed, like um, the top of this picture, this is looking uh, less healthy. This is maybe um, a mowed, something that's mowed or ditched or, or something like that, but it's, it's not um, as healthy as the bright red area. And then you can even add hyperspectral sensors so that's having lots and lots, lots and lots of sensors with lots of different bands, picking up very individual wavelengths of that spectrum. And you can just get a crazy amount of detail from these types of data. You can even start to pick out um, different species. So you can see this low vegetation is a different color than these trees. And even within the trees, you know, these are two different areas of trees. They've got very different colors. So you can start to differentiate species. So now that you have the sensors and they've collected the data and you combine whatever color bands together that you need for your analysis, the product from that is a raster. The usable product is a raster. And that is a file that contains um, cells or pixels that are organized into rows and columns where each cell has a value with representative information. So here's, here's an example of that. Here's a picture of a face. I keep thinking it looks like Abe Lincoln, but maybe not. Um, so when the camera took the photo on the left, the sensor inside the camera measured a value for each and every pixel. So each one of these little cells, it recorded a value. Um, and those values are shown in the center photo and on the right. And in this example, true black is a value of zero. So you can see a couple of those down here by the, the beard or whatever this is. And pure white is 255. Uh, or 256. So there's a couple um, you can see that are nearing that here. Oh, here's a 255. Um, so what we're looking at here is, is a gray scale of all the possibilities between zero and 255 that that sensor recorded. Um, and what, a, what the computer sees, what ArcGIS sees is this. It sees the matrix on the right, just numbers. But what we see, our human eyes, um, see a pattern in that, which is more like the picture on the left. The same concept applies here um, for satellite uh, color imagery of Logan Airport, which is on the left. Again, this is made up of um, tens of thousands of pixels. Each little pixel, you just can't see the pixels because it's such a high resolution image. Each little pixel has a number in it. Um, this little pixel is a greenish blue and this pixel is a gray and you know this one is a darker blue. And the same for the rasters on the right. So even though these aren't images, these are actually still rasters, the top being um, a bathymetry map. So this is based on a, a bathymetry survey where each little cell had a number for depth. And the bottom is a raster example um, from a land use map where each little cell is identified as being forest or water or wetland or, or residential or what have you. These are all considered rasters. And there's countless analytical uses for rasters. Uh, the most relevant to our field of study is change detection. Um, so like DEP's yellow grass mapping program, they collect imagery every five years and those, the imagery are rasters. And they take those rasters and then they're manually analyzing those for eelgrass by drawing polygons uh, on top of the rasters, like what we're gonna be doing for this project. Um, there's other change detection tools out there. There's a whole bunch of them um, that use machine learning uh, to look for that change over time. So that's where you don't have a human drawing 
uh, boundaries anymore, drawing polygons. You have a machine drawing the, the boundaries for you. Um, we're not we're not using that yet uh, in this area. There's there's lots of limitations to that as well, but there's lots of tools out there that can do exactly that. Another neat um, analytical use of rasters is using math. So um, the value that's stored in each little cell of a raster can be used to carry out algebra. So for example, if you use LIDAR, that's using light to measure um, height and bathymetry, you can collect surface elevation um, and terrain elevation, and then you could subtract those to get the canopy height of a forest. Um, and that same application is used for seagrass, canopy height with certain types of echo sounders. Tay, I know you're, you've used these before like biosonics. Um, so it sends a, a ping of sound directly down underneath a boat, measures the height to the canopy and a height to the seafloor. And it just, you do math to figure out the height of the canopy. So it's another neat, and there's just many, many other applications like this. So where are we at? 40 minutes. Okay. So I promise we'll do it. We'll do a little bathroom break in, in a cup in a little bit, but I'm going to get through um, these important variables to know about when working with rasters specifically. One is projection. This is a sticking point and it's taken me forever to fully understand and respect projection. So I hope I, I hope I make this clear for everyone. So what projection does, if you think about the globe, it's a three-dimensional sphere. And if you're trying to take imagery of the, of the globe, take a picture anywhere, uh, especially from a, from a far distance or elevation, you're trying to get a, a curved surface to display on a two-dimensional surface when you're looking at a, just an image or a GIS map. That's a, a two-dimensional surface. You can't have shape to that. So you need to transform from a 3D to a 2D. And the way you do that is through projections. And they all create various distortions. They might distort the shape of um, a feature, the, area, the measured area of a feature, or the distance, or they might distort all of those things. So the best practice is to use the, the um, projection that reduces the error the most. So in the picture, um, if you're creating a map of the entire globe in the cylindric projections, it's on the left. We've all seen a map that looks like this on the bottom where Antarctica is <laughs> enormous. Clearly, that's not the size of Antarctica. It looks like it's larger than all of the continents combined. So this distortion um, is both is shape, area, and distance. All of those things are distorted for Antarctica. But this distortion might work, or this projection might work very well for other parts of the world. Um, there's conical. This again might distort some areas more than others and planar. So that's um, just taking a, a small surface area and making it flat. Here in Massachusetts, um, we have a standard and that's the mass state plane coordinate system in NAD 1983 in meters specifically. Um, this is what the MassGIS office uses for every single data product. It's, it's um, just unanimously considered the state standard. And that's what we're using for this project exclusively. And um, this projection applies a, a conical, like the middle one. It's very similar to this, um, to this middle projection, which is very good for uh, mid latitudes, like where we exist um, in Massachusetts. And it's also very good for uh, long features, like Massachusetts being very long east to west. Uh, it's, it's especially good for those. If we were a skinny, narrow state like um, Vermont or New Hampshire, it might not work as well. This is just an example um, showing a map of the United States with four different projections. Um, our state projection is not shown here, that, that mass um, state plane, but it most closely resembles this bottom right one, WGS 84 on the bottom. Um, these are usually ours and 84 are usually within about a meter of each other because they, they stretch um, the map in, in a very similar way. But just note, um, you know, none of these are right or wrong. It depends on what you're trying to show in your map and the analyses you're trying to do. But it's, it's um, sort of staggering to look at the difference um, in tilt and in stretch that the different projections create um, using the same exact data, using the same US map. 
So it's just something important to keep in mind. Another uh, critical concept is scale. And that is um, the ratio of the distance on the map to the actual distance on the ground. There's lots of definitions of scale out there, even in remote sensing. This is the one um, that, that is relevant to us and, and the work that we're doing. Um, the way that scale is read uh, is in um, a colon a ratio format with a colon in between. So this is read on the bottom left here as one to one, mil one million, one to one million. So that's saying that in this map of coastal Massachusetts, um, one unit on the map is equal to one million units in real life on the ground. Um, if we are making the units inches, that's one inch on the map, if you held up a ruler right here, is equal to a million inches on the ground. And it's really hard to conceptualize what a million inches means. And that's about 15 miles. So that helps you conceptualize that a little bit. Like if you hold your fingers up one inch on this map, yeah, that makes sense. That's 15 miles on land. If we zoom in, um, we'll increase our, uh, our, our scale. This is one to 100,000. Now we're just looking at Boston Harbor here. Zoom in more to one to 10,000. Now we're looking at um, the actual uh, airport buildings. And one to 600, we're zoomed all the way into an airplane. So that's one unit um, on the map is 600 units on the ground. If we're talking inches, one inch held up to the map is 600 inches on the ground, which is um, equal to 50 feet, which makes sense uh, if, if you're looking at the, the size of an airplane. One inch of this airplane is about 50 feet. Uh, image resolution is extremely important in remote sensing, especially for our project. Uh, and what resolution means, and I've mentioned this a few times already in this talk, um, the definition is the size of each pixel in an image. And this is so important because it determines how fine or coarse the patterns in the image appear. So for example, in this top square, we have an eelgrass blob. This is an eelgrass meadow. If we take a picture of that, using um, two meter image resolution where each one of those pixels is two meters in size. Uh, we have some detail, um, but you see it's, it, we don't have a very fine shape to the eelgrass meadow. We just are limited by the size of our pixels. If we use a higher resolution image like one meter, we start to see a little bit more detail of that meadow. And if we move even higher in resolution, like half meter resolution, you get a whole lot more detail. And to um, give a, a real world example, this is actual imagery from our project or the PSM project um, at Niles Beach in Gloucester. On the left is the satellite imagery, three meter resolution. So you can actually start to see the pixelation, those pixels. Each one of those little tiny squares is three meters in size, three meters by three meters. So pretty coarse. Um, the DEP aerial flight is quarter meter, 0.25 meter resolution. You no longer see those little cells until you zoom way in. Um, so you start to see a lot more detail. Drone imagery is um, 0.03, um, ooh, this is wrong, it's three centimeters, 0.03 meters. Um, so even more detail there. And um, to give a little more context there, if we just zoom in on the, this dock, um, that's up here at a scale of one to 100. Um, you can barely, I mean, you can't recognize it really. In the satellite imagery, um, you just kind of see some lighter um, pixels here where the dock may exist, but you can start to draw it out in, um, in the aerial imagery. And then it's crystal clear in the drone imagery. So this, this is really the heart of the matter with this project is, um, can we use these data sources to reliably map eelgrass? And how, if they're wrong, if, they're, uh, if they tend to um, be off by some amount, if they tend to miss eelgrass, by how much do they miss it? Um, so that this really gets at some of the issues of image resolution and, and using imagery to map natural resources. Environmental conditions are, are really important, especially when you're using um, imagery. 
because they affect the ability to see the targeted features. And that's especially true when water is involved because water is a very complicated um, uh, material to map over and through. So um, this was from my, my thesis on using drones to map eelgrass. Uh, fortunately, other people have developed the optimal conditions, environmental conditions for um, aerial mapping of, of eelgrass, especially using drones. You don't have to remember any of this stuff, but it's just to note that, you know, the things that are important are things like the sun angle. You don't want it right overhead uh, because then you'll have direct sun glare bouncing off the water, uh, bouncing back to the sensors. So you won't be able to see through the water as well. Wind speed, um, both for the safety of the equipment, like an airplane or a drone, and also for a chop on the water. Cloud cover, you don't really want intermittent clouds. You have a lot or very little um, so that it's, you don't have uh, areas of, of shadows caused by clouds. And then things like weight, low wave height, um, low turbidity, and low tide. These are the sorts of things that really alter success with mapping, especially underwater. So I'll, I'll stop there for a minute um, and see if that's a, a whole lot of information. Um, I'll just stop my share for a sec. See if anybody has questions on what's been covered so far. Before we get, we're gonna get into principles more specific to eelgrass now. Is everyone hating me right now? <laughs> No, you've done a great job, Jill, and it's, okay. it's uh, really um, very un understandable and um, digestible because, uh, yeah, like you said, this you can spend years <laughs> studying this and <laughs> trying to figure it out. I, I guess I was confused a little bit when you're talking about the mass state plane coordinate. I know that, but at one, at one point I thought you said planar and then you said conical. So is it just that you maybe I heard you say state plane? So the planar, planar is not involved at all. It's just the conical. No, it actually is. It, okay. it does. It uses a cone. Yes, it, it actually uses a um, the cone um, to deal with the, the sphere mm -hmm. issue. It uses the cone, but then there's a, a specific planar just oh. for our state. Yeah. So it combines. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. combines the the NAD 83 part is the datum. So there's yep. there's lots of different things that are that are sort of baked into a projection. It's both the how to deal with the going from 3D to 2D. And then also how to deal with datum. So what is your sort of zero point on the map? And there's different ones all, all over the place. And yep. um, yeah, mm -hmm. so Thanks. I was using planar for that. Okay. I know it's. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I'm hearing double things, but that makes perfect sense now that you explained it. Yeah. yeah. OK. Let me see. I wonder if this is a let me see if this is where we should stop or if we should do you guys, does anyone need a break or should we? press on for a little bit longer and, and take a five minute break after this next section. All right, I'm gonna press on. <laughs> Good. Um, go back to sharing. Okay, so um, general principles of mapping eelgrass specifically. Um, so, Mapping eelgrass involves using a photo interpreter. Um, that is a person trained in the techniques of examining aerial photographs or other remote sensing images in order to identify the features in that image. And the way this used to be done, including at DEP in the early days of their, um, you know, back in 1995, when they started their eelgrass mapping program was with a stereoscope. So it's using actual film side by side and looking through this contraption all day long a stereoscope um, to combine. I, I've never used one of these before, honestly, but it, it combines the two images together and um, which provides relief and also lets you look at the different bands against each other. Um, thank goodness we are now using uh, GIS and digital imagery to do all of this because um, <laughs> I don't know if I would have gotten into this field if it involved a stereoscope. And then of course GIS is a geographic information system um, or software used for creating and evaluating geographic information like maps, aerial photographs, or site-specific data, and all sorts of other um, geographic information, not just um, photographs and maps. Uh, it's important to note that ArcGIS, even though we talk about that a lot, and that's kind of, they're sort of the leader in the field, 
That's just one example of a GIS. There are many, many out there. There's free ones like QGIS. There's a whole bunch of them out there. And um, Esri is just one of many that has that creates GIS products out there. Signature is the most important concept um, that you'll learn today. And um, it, it's the identification of a feature in photography and it requires visual evaluation of all of the fundamental elements you see here. The combination of all of these elements combined is the features signature. So eelgrass has a signature and that's what we're um, about to learn about. So we'll learn how all of these different elements um, factor into the eelgrass signature. First is tone and you can think of tone as color it is the relative brightness or color of objects in an image. For eelgrass, there are variations in tone and that can be due to the depth, um, the meadow health, um, environmental conditions during the image capture, like what tide state you're at, um, the turbidity of the water, if there's brown epiphytes all over the eelgrass, um, what season you're in. Uh, and included in tone is a very important element for eelgrass mapping of contrast. So here's an example of um, imagery. This is Google Earth imagery over Kingston. Sarah, in your neck of the woods, um, there's a lot going on here. So just adjust your eyes for a minute to the different tones that you're seeing. Um, tones, colors, different saturations of color, uh, very mild, um, slight differences between areas, those are all significant in remote sensing. You know, there's sort of like this stained looking area right here. Um, these are all significant changes in tone. And I'll point out what some of those are. Uh, we have aquaculture activities here. Um, depending on the gear, they might appear lighter in color, they might appear darker in color. Um, we have eelgrass. Uh, this is underwater here um, and also up here. We have exposed mud flats, so this is an, a low tide image, and then submerged sand. So that sort of staining is really just a difference between water being present or not present. And you know, this might be, Sarah could speak to it, it's probably an inch of water or something right here. And it has the ability to alter the tone that much. Uh, Jill, mm -hmm. in, in looking at this one, um... Thank you for telling us what we're looking at. But how would you not? How would you know that that's not rock? The, where the eelgrass is, like just a, a boulder field. Yeah, yeah. We're, that that's when it, we're going to get to rocks. Too. Okay, good. <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, so here's another example um, from Sarah's area. This is Google Earth imagery of Plymouth. Again, a lot going on here. So just let your eyes pan the image for a minute. Try to ignore the black dashed line that's not part of nature. <laughs> so there's a lot happening here. Eelgrass exists uh, along the channel here. It's a very dark tone, almost black. It's like the darkest green um, before you get to black. Um, there's other dark areas that are not eelgrass. There's algae up here. Uh, and I'm, I'm only saying that uh, with, with knowledge of what's in this area. I'm not, I'm not saying you should know that this is algae up here. Um, you could see that this is a little more brown than black, slightly different than the eelgrass signature. Also down here by the marina, um, the lower left, this is algae. It doesn't have that super dark black appearance to it. And all these little dots, these little donut holes, that's the mooring field where there's algae accumulating in the, um, the mooring scar. So that, you know, that scour hole that's created from the chain going around and around collects algae and detritus. So in a winter image like this, you're seeing those little holes filled with algae. There's also some algae um, over here on the right-hand side. Again, not dark, dark black, like the eelgrass signature. And again, I don't have it labeled, but there's, you could see the difference between exposed sand and submerged sand here. Here is another Plymouth example. So here we have some rocks um, and they are emergent. So these are above water. Um, 
different colors of the, the channel and these little channels that come through the mud flat. And like Barbara said, how do we how do we know? Because these are very dark black looking dots here. Are these eelgrass patches? Are these cobbles? Are these what are these? I'm not sure. I'm honestly not sure. These could be little eelgrass patches. Um, could be rocks. And if you see these rocks um, along the shoreline, it can, it can help you sort of compare. You know, there's rocks on the shore. There's rocks immediately underwater. It helps you kind of compare the shape, the color to what you're seeing elsewhere. Um, so a lot of photo interpretation is, is sort of using what you do know about an area or can deduce to help you understand other parts of the image too. Um, some of these stain looking areas, uh, they're more of like a greenish brown. Those are algae in the mud flat. Uh, there's a lot of that happening up here. Um, and then eelgrass, again, that dark black up along the channel. This is a drone image. So we were just looking at Google Earth satellite imagery. This is a drone image from Manchester. Um, note the high contrast. I mentioned before how important contrast is. This um, image is such a good example of uh, seeing sand compared to algae, compared to eelgrass, compared to rocks. Um, so sand, of course, being the light yellowish tan color. Um, we have rocks with what looks like red, uh, some red filamentous type algae and some detritus and stuff. Um, bands of algae, you can really tell the color difference between the algae here and the eelgrass. This is the greenish, more, it looks more green than black here in a drone image um, compared to the brown color of the algae. I really like this picture a lot. And then I think this is a mooring right here, right in the middle of the picture, the white ball. Um, yeah, and then there's lots of, you know, so you sort of have to do some deducing. There's, I see this brown algae and I'm seeing these little brown blobs and the blobs look a lot more similar to the algae color than to the eelgrass color. So there's a, there's a lot of that happening in image interpretation. So here's a, a complicated one um, from, this is a drone image in Swampscott. This is tricky because the water depth plays a really important role here. This is, um, there's a lot of boating activity and moorings at this site. So the deeper water does have a bit of turbidity. So in the, um, this area over here, this is the deeper part of the eelgrass meadow, more continuous. But over on the right, this is also eelgrass. And you can even see, if you see where my cursor is, that's actually, you know, you can see individual shoots. So we know it's eelgrass. You can see the, the shoots um, almost coming all the way up to the surface of the water. But look how similar that green eelgrass signature tone looks to ulva up on the beach. So we know this is ulva on shore. It's most likely ulva immediately adjacent um, underwater, but somewhere in here, there's a change from eelgrass to ulva. So I'll highlight just this little area and zoom way in. And when you're zoomed way in, you can start to see differences in that color. So on the left, there's eelgrass and we can sort of see the individual shoots. And over on the right is ulva and some rocks and maybe some red algae and, and things like that. So it's um, a less obvious difference, but there is a difference in that green color. And then this is just a neat photo I wanted to include. Um, <laughs> when we flew over Swampscott, we, I didn't know it at the time until I processed the imagery, but we caught a whole um, bait ball, a huge school of, um, I think, pogies or menhaden right off of, right off the eelgrass meadow, which is really neat. So, you know, you might look at this zoomed this far in and think you're seeing maybe some kind of vegetation. Oh, I'm seeing a pattern, I'm seeing lines. But in the context of the site, um, <laughs> turned out to be a big school of fish, which is neat. So uh, moving on to texture. So we're only on the second of the <laughs> of the um, elements. Texture is the arrangement and frequency of color variation in particular areas of the image. 
So it's really um, that that variation of color creates texture because it's not something we're actually feeling. Normally when we think texture, we think of how something feels, but when we're talking vision, we're just talking about variation. Here's an example of texture in um, Lynn Harbor. So this is a, a mackerel pattern. I know Tay and I like to call it that. It looks sort of like the side of a um, mackerel fish. Um, and the, this is all eelgrass and the eelgrass is in bands, long skinny bands. And that's, um, they're usually parallel. And that's usually um, has to do something with the, the amount of energy and the direction of energy coming in and out of an area. Uh, like current and, and tides and things, and storms. So that I would call more of a rough texture. And then you have the rocks up here, which in our minds, we'd probably normal, normally think of rocks as a rough texture. But in this image, these are far more smooth than the eelgrass. There's less variation. It's more consistent um, across all the pixels in this area over here. It's tricky because you can have lots of textures in one area. So this part of the eelgrass meadow is the mackerel pattern, that really rough pattern. But then in these slightly more protected little um, pockets over here, that's dense eelgrass. So that again becomes more smooth. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, that brings in the context of the site. And then another example of smooth texture obviously is the sand up here where there's not, not a lot of variation. Here's an example of side scan sonar imagery. Um, Again, this is side scan is a really good example of rough versus smooth. You could see it without me telling you. I'm sure the eelgrass um, pattern is where it's rough. So this is this sort of cloudy, fluffy looking signature. And where it's smooth is sand, bare sand. This is actually a mooring. Um, so a, a side scan image is, is looking at a, creates a flat um, two dimensional image of the seafloor. This is a mooring scar with the mooring block in the middle. So there's no eelgrass in the scar, it's nice and smooth, and there's eelgrass outside of the scar. This is a, a drone image from um, Hodgkin's Cove in Gloucester. Um, this is a this is really neat um, example of texture because we have rocks in the intertidal, they're exposed in this picture, and they're covered in fucus or something um, that looks very green. Maybe some ulva mixed in there as well. Up here in the higher intertidal, it's, it's just dried up crusty fucus. Um, but you could see the green color is quite similar to the eelgrass signature, but it's the texture that's different. It's the context and the texture that's different. So similar color, different texture. And then if you go deeper, I mean, this is eelgrass too. So again, you're dealing with changes in texture even within the target habitat, even within eelgrass, you can have it rougher and then again, smoother. Pattern is extremely useful in mapping eelgrass and that's the spatial arrangement of the features into distinctive reoccurring, recurring forms. So here's an example in Kingston, and I hate this example because of what's happening in it. But, um, this is uh, aquaculture and eelgrass. Uh, alongside each other. So there's a clear pattern, you know, the color is very similar. These cages are almost identical in color to eelgrass, um, but there's a pattern. I mean, I don't think you'd ever look at this and think this was perfectly rectangular eelgrass beds, but it um, drives home the point that if you're zoomed way out in an image, um, you need to be sure to zoom in, and especially if you're seeing something peculiar, like a very unique pattern like this, and confirm what you're seeing first. Um, so this is the difference between aquaculture and eelgrass, which um, this is sort of the classic pattern that we're seeing. You have a, a more dense central part of the meadow, and then you tend to get a little more patchy as you reach the edges um, on both sides, both the deep and the shallow edges. This is one from um, Duxbury. So uh, there's both sand waves and eelgrass in this picture. Sand waves can look really interesting in aerial, aerial imagery and they can almost mess with your eyes and make you think you're seeing um, some eelgrass features. But in this case, it's not. These are just, um, these are just sand waves over on the left and the eelgrass is that dark greenish black on the right. 
in a very narrow band. And then there's some sort of water disturbance in this uh, white um, wiggly line that goes down the channel. That could be, you know, a boat just went through or maybe the tide is changing and water's coming through. That's just more of a, a water surface disturbance. This is a Google, Google Earth image of Nahant. And this site is, um, is a tricky one to look at with imagery because you wanna think that this is all a big eelgrass meadow over here, but it's actually not. The eelgrass is, um, is over on the right, over by the, the dock. This is actually a large rock area and some clues to that um, could be the, the patterns that we see. So it's very uniform in color. There's not a lot of variation going on there. It's a very distinct edge along much of it. Um, the eelgrass you know, has a denser portion with some lower density patches around the edges of it. Somewhere between the rocks and the eelgrass is a transition where it turns from one to the other. And I don't know where that is. This, I mean, this could be eelgrass growing right up to the rocks. I'm, I'm not sure and we would need to fully evaluate the image. So we'd be zooming in, we'd be you know, trying to gather other context clues to what that might be. And then there's some um, very visible algae here. I'm sure your, your eyes are starting to get trained on what on this area up here in the north. Um, it's a totally different color. So that's not eelgrass, it's more of a green, stripey, stringy appearance, and that is um, algae. And some, some more rocks over here as well. Um, I apologize, this is not the best image, but this is a, a, another side scan sonar example. Um, again, looking at patterns, uh, and I just wanted to point out underwater structures. So we, we already saw a mooring um, block on the seafloor. This is um, pier piles. So the piles from this public pier that comes out into Swamp Scott. Um, the side scan sonar is only looking at what structures are on the seafloor. It's not gonna see the surface of the pier. It's just seeing the underwater portion. That's why we see these four or five piles evenly spaced that are supporting this pier. And I always thought that was pretty neat to be able to see that. The eelgrass signature is, is totally different over here, um, including you know, patchy areas. And this, um, this is drone imagery over Swampscott. And I just wanted to point out um, the importance of, of context. We're gonna talk a little bit more about context too, but this is a, a heavily impacted meadow. So you may not see the patterns that you expect to see like in a pristine meadow. So we would like to see dense continuous eelgrass everywhere that it exists, but we know it doesn't. When it's a heavily impacted meadow, you really start to see more of these patchy blobs around. Sometimes the blobs get smaller and smaller. These patches are, are very, very small. Sometimes they're larger. Um, and in a, a meadow like this, um, mooring fields especially get very tricky because of the, um, the amount of um, algae and detritus you end up accumulating. So like this, the area I'm circling right now, we have a, a little green eelgrass patch and that looks like there's some detritus and red algae accumulating in the, um, this little protected cove <laughs> that the eelgrass has created. You know, at, along this edge of the patch, there's a, a little protected hollow area where detritus is accumulating. So it makes it even, it makes it even trickier um, when you have a heavily impacted area like this. Um, element number four is shape, uh, the general form, structure, and outline of the features. This is a neat picture um, from Google Earth over Duxbury. Um, this, these long sweeping uh, stringy looking areas, these are all algae. Um, very different from the signature that eelgrass has at this site, which is, you know, the more distinct um, edges, um, even in fingers here, because of the amount of current you have coming in through this channel, through this opening. So you end up with these sort of finger shapes to the eelgrass. Um, so very different um, shape there to the, to the features. There's an area of, of rocks and mussels, which are hard to see on the screen, I know. Um, and just to point out a color difference, there's looks like there's some ulva or, or some other kind of filament of green algae 
accumulating here on this little spit. So um, there's not real much, not much of a shape to that, but at, at least there's a color difference there. So another example of, of shape, this is Provincetown. The eelgrass is, is over here along the channel. Again, we're seeing um, sort of finger-like um, portions of the meadow. There's some patchiness. There's a, just a distinct shape to what that meadow looks like as compared to some of these little, um, these little like, I don't know what you even call these, these little um, areas of the intertidal sandbar uh, where water's flowing in and out, little rivulets that are accumulating something, algae and um, detritus maybe. Uh, very different shape to these. They sort of take over the entire shallow area. Um, it looks a lot different than the, than the distinct fingers um, and patches in the eelgrass meadow. And then again, there's aquaculture here as well. Uh, another way of thinking about shape is the shape of the coastline and the contours. So this is, you know, thinking kind of at a, a different scale when you're looking at the image. This is a drone image from Hodgkin's Cove. Um, maybe we should look at the, the NOAA chart first, the depth chart. So it, the cove, you know, is kind of limited by um, a hard wall, a vertical wall on the right, and a, um, a rocky coastline on the left. But it really has this sort of like U shape um, in the cove. And then the contours tend to follow that U shape. And then not surprisingly, the eelgrass meadow follows a U shape. Um, and, and it seems to go, you know, almost up to that uh, intertidal line, up to the zero contour. And it's sort of, if you follow the contour line in, in that shape, but the eelgrass meadow seems to generally follow the same line too. So that's another way of, of thinking about shape. Size is the next element, and this depends largely on the scale um, that you're working at and the resolution of the image. So smaller features are gonna be easier to detect in that higher resolution imagery, like drone imagery. Some small features are just not going to be um, detectable in lower resolution images. You might not see that individual little patch in a satellite image, you most likely won't. So here's um, just thinking, you know, to, to think about the concept of size. This is in Duxbury. There are these lots of little channels kind of cutting through the eelgrass. Depending on what scale you're working at, you might be drawing, you know, you might be tempted to draw an eelgrass polygon around the whole thing. Um, or if you're zoomed way in, if you're interested in this particular meadow patch, you're, you're gonna go, you know, draw individual polygons around each one. So that's, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying what's right and wrong for this project at this moment, but um, just something to keep in mind. The, the meadow size and the um, size that you're looking at, the scale you're looking at in your map. Again, these little tiny um, patches, more likely to be able to detect those in a high resolution image. I like this image too, because it uh, very clearly shows those kind of stringy bands of, um, of algae of a different color. You can really see that those are a, a red compared to the, the greenish black color. But in terms of size, I mean, I don't know if you can, I hope the resolution is not reduced um, in the screen share, but on my screen, I can see little black dots in the area I'm circling here. I mean, are those eelgrass? Do we include them in, a, <laughs> in our mapping? These are the sorts of things that a photo interpreter um, has to deal with. So sometimes it's a professional, best professional judgment, and sometimes it's going out and collecting ground truthing information. So there's, there's ways of dealing with areas like that. So context is very important, um, also called association. It describes the target features association with other nearby features or conditions. So uh, we all know what context means and the way it applies to remote sensing. Um, you know, if you're looking at this image off of uh, Swampscott, there's, there's some situation happening here. There's some um, change happening between deeper water and shallow water. And one of the clues, one of the context clues is the rack line. So there's clearly um, detritus and red algae accumulating on the beach. It's very likely that this material that's right offshore is rack. It just hasn't made it to the beach yet. So this is all algae and detritus. So using those, those types of context clues. This is a neat one from Billingsgate Shoals and Wellfleet. Um, 
the context of, of this site is so tricky. This is um, lots of sandbars and very dynamic um, sand waves that are moving around all the time. Uh, the NOAA chart can provide a little bit of context, but this is a, the NOAA chart is a snapshot in time and, and not necessarily accurate in a dynamic area. And um, so that provides one clue. Um, but is this all is this all eelgrass growing in between all the, you know, in, sort of in the lee of all the sandbars? Um, the best context clue when you're doing photo interpretation is looking to historic maps of eelgrass. So that's what I would, if I was trying to delineate eelgrass on this Google Earth map, I would look to DEP's historic maps and say, oh yes, look, they already documented that that's eelgrass. I'm gonna also call it eelgrass. Um, unfortunately, we're not doing that for this project because that would bias, you know, if, if you were in charge of um, delineating the drone imagery and you went and looked at DEP's polygons, that would give you a clue as to what you're seeing. So we're trying to avoid that bias and not letting you access um, historic eelgrass data. Location um, takes into account the relationship between um, the features in proximity um, between other recognizable objects or features in proximity to your target. So there, here's an example from Duxbury. Um, proximity is very important at this site. There's channels, so you've got clean uh, water flushing the area. That's important. an important consideration for eelgrass mapping. Is there a channel supplying clean water? Um, what's the depth situation? We've already talked about that a couple times. Um, these are the sorts of location considerations to, to make and sandy substrate, you know, is, is there sand here? What are the locations of, um, of the features that eelgrass needs to be somewhere? Shadow, um, <laughs> we also all know what shadow means, the visible area of darkness cast to the side of a feature. Um, this can help detect the feature and can also help differentiate it from others. That's especially eelgrass versus rocks and boulders, and especially with um, sonar, side scan sonar. This is less useful um, for using imagery, satellite and aerial and drone imagery, because we're looking directly downward onto our target, we're less likely to see that shadow cast off to the side. You don't really get shadows um, underwater, but it's extremely useful for sonar. So uh, just to remind you, um, in a side scan sonar survey, this red arrow up the middle, that's the, the center line, the boat is traveling that way. Um, and the sonar is looking directly underneath the boat to the left and to the right, creating an image based on the sound that returns. It's going right over, um, if you can see my screen on the bottom, it's going right here next to these, these rocks, this emergent island. And this is what it's seeing underwater is this rock surface. You can see these big boulders have a shadow behind them. So that's the shadow. The sound is going out to the left of the boat, hitting the rock and the sound can't see behind the rock. So it casts a shadow. That's, that's why a shadow is, is created in sonar imagery. The same to the right, although these are like little cobbles, the sound is going out to the right. It's hitting these little rocks, creating shadows behind the rocks. And then it eventually comes over and hits the eelgrass. This is the eelgrass edge here somewhere. You can have shadows in the eelgrass meadow too. So here's um, the sonar image to the right. The boat again is going up the center line. Um, the, the sound is getting pinged out to the side. It hits this edge of the eelgrass meadow. It can't see up and over the eelgrass blades. So it forms a shadow in the image. Just another example of that, um, rocks um, have that shadow behind them. Eelgrass, especially if it's kind of petering out lower density edge areas, you might not see any shadow at all. So uh, definitely a clear difference between the mooring block shadow here and this fluffy signature, which is the eelgrass next to it. Okay, so now I, I'll definitely take a minute um, and see if we have any questions uh, before we get to the, I think is the last, yeah, the last section. Anything? Okay. Anybody need a break? <laughs> 
Okay. Also, I had one observation, Jill. Um, first of all, this is awesome. And Thanks. Really great. Um, in one of your images, you showed the algae. <clears throat> you could see, and there was eelgrass on one side, and then there's algae. And it was very clear that it was this wispy algae, but you could also see eelgrass mixed in. And I guess I just wanted to note that, that, um, you know, you're telling us the difference between the eelgrass and the algae, but then like there's also like the mixtures that yeah. occur and, and we also have to map eelgrass that's mixed in with algae. And so it gets yeah tricky. I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out. Those transition areas are the hardest. Those are the, the ones that you lose sleep. Oh, well, maybe not, but the ones that cause the greatest headache when you're trying to, to trying to do this stuff. Um, because that still is habitat. Those areas, those mixed areas are still considered part of the meadow. Um, but you know, as resource managers, you don't wanna overestimate or underestimate the meadow. You wanna try to get it right. So they're, they're definitely tricky. And that's where um, ground truthing is, is so critical. So you'd go out and, um, and check those areas if you can. All right, let's take, um, I'll just do a quick break. So how about, Come back at 11.30, four minutes. All right, thank you. See you in a minute. Okay. All right, so now we'll get into um, the actual steps and rules and principles for mapping eelgrass for this project. So everything we've covered so far is, um, is recognized in the industry as the standards. Those, those elements that we just discussed, those are remote sensing, elements. Those are the standards if you're mapping forests or um, eelgrass or canyons, whatever it is, those are the same principles you're applying. So now we're going to get more into the rules that are specific to this project that you're not necessarily going to find anywhere else. So the rules we will be applying um, and that you and your teams will be responsible for um, you will have access to the data, obviously, the imagery collected for the project, and then you'll be able to use some secondary data that's limited to bathymetry. So you can use the NOAA depth charts that are available in GIS to get some of that shape and context information. And I'll also provide some ground truthing points, not all of them. So I mentioned that we'll have, um, we have 450 ground truthing points for the project. Um, I don't want to give those all to you because um, there would be some bias there. You know, if, if uh, we found eelgrass in a ground truthing point where you can't actually see it in the image, we wouldn't want you to, um, to draw it based on the ground truthing point. That's instead meant to help you train your eye. So we will give you several ground truthing points just to assure you, oh, yep, that dark green black area is eelgrass. It's not a rock or, or whatnot. And maybe we will give areas where it's it's more difficult, like an algae area or a rock area. It's gonna it's gonna depend on the um, the site and the data type that you have. But you will you'll be given those two pieces of secondary data that you can use. Um, you should not be, and you can't really be looking at other um, data sources. Don't go into Google Earth and um, and look at other aerial imagery, um, don't look at DEPs, eelgrass layers. If, if we were trying to create the best eelgrass maps possible, then yes, we would be using every source of data possible. But the whole point of this project is to find the limitations of each of the data types. So it's not, um, the goal is to not um, try to create the best eelgrass map that you can, it's to create the eelgrass map that you can using your specific data type and no others. I hope that makes sense. That's a very, very important part of this project. Um, so then uh, in addition to those two pieces, the only other rules to follow are those in table 11 from the QAP and those are here. And that's this is the rule um, table that will just sit next to you while you have your imagery on the screen telling you, you know, what, um, what you can and can't do. So, I'll just run down the, um, the satellite uh, column as an example. So um, Randall, when you and your team have the satellite imagery up, the scale you're allowed to use when you're exploring the image is unlimited. There's no limit. You can zoom in and out, up and down, all around. You can do whatever you need to get 
that context, the spatial context of the site to look around. Um, when it comes time to actually draw the polygon, you'll be working at that one to 1000 scale. So that's zoomed in pretty tight, that's close. That's kind of like, um, uh, I should have shown an example here, but that's, that's zoomed in fairly close. So then you're really, um, you, you know, almost going pixel by pixel, making your decision of where you'll draw that line. Spectral restrictions for image exploration. Spectral is, is the same as color. Um, restrictions for that, if, if you have the interest and the capacity to change those things in your in ARC, which you can, but if, if you have the ability to do it, you're welcome to change the contrast and the brightness and all of those things while you're exploring. However, when it comes time, and, and if you're satellite imagery, you could even recombine the bands if you wanted to put infrared in there or change. You could explore in any way you want to. However, when it comes time to actually draw the polygons, you'll be in that natural color, a true color, you know, the color that our eyes can see. However, um, there are stretches in GIS, and I'm going to show examples of those. Stretches that you can apply that take the data from each of those little pixels, takes the statistics on them, creates a histogram, and you can manipulate that histogram in different ways. You can chop off the outliers, which draws more attention to the, the bulk of the pixels. There's all sorts of different stretches that you can do that help draw out different features. And that is okay for drawing polygons. And I'll, I'm gonna give an example of that in a minute. Minimum mapping unit, that is a very common term in remote sensing. That's sort of the smallest unit um, or size that your feature needs to be to either be included or excluded from your map. So DEP does have a minimum mapping unit when they do this. There's is um, how big is it? A tenth of an acre, I think. So if they can see an eelgrass patch and it's a tenth of an acre or smaller and a certain distance from there, the other eelgrass, they're not including it in their map. Even if it's there and even if it's visible, it won't be included if it's underneath their minimum mapping unit. For our project, there is no minimum mapping unit. If you see the eelgrass, you map it. However, there is a distance threshold. So that's the bottom row there, maximum distance threshold. So that's between patches and that's to bridge them together along the edge. And that generates a line smoothing. So um, rather than have, you know, try and, I'll, I'll show an example of this too. Um, it's, it's just creating a smoother line and gives you um, instructions on what to do if patches aren't lined up just right to make a nice smooth line across them if they're sort of bumpy all along the edge. And that is the same distance for all of the methods, 10 meters. We're gonna, when we do our one-on-one -on -one practice together, we're gonna go really deep into all of these rules. So this is just intended to be an, sort of an intro to the rules. So I want to show an example of um, what the, the stretches are in GIS. This is um, DEP's imagery in Gloucester. This is not the study site. I'm not showing any of the study sites in this because I don't want to bias anybody on, based on what they're seeing. So these are all other sites. This is um, a cove next to Niles Beach in Gloucester. And this is the raw image as it was delivered from DEP. It's you can kind of see, you can see some eelgrass in the shallow edge, you know, maybe it goes all the way up to shore here. Uh, it's a little harder to see on this side of the dock, maybe it goes out like this, and you can barely see a deep edge, but if you really train your eyes along where my cursor is, there's a little bit there. So if I were drawing this, um, No, I lost it now that I looked away. Yeah, it'd be something along here and the shallow edge, something like maybe right up to those rocks, it looks like. I think this goes up to shore. I mean, we'd be, we'd be zoomed, we'd be um, zoomed way in because we're at one to 1000 right here. And the um, aerial imagery is one to 500. So it's just a, just a quick example. But, um, and you can see that that was challenging um, but if we stretch the image um, in GIS, oh, can I let me clear that off? If we stretch the image, uh, it draws out those features. This is something called a histogram equalize stretch. So again, it's it's taking the values in each and every one of those little tiny pixels, 
doing some statistics on them to figure out you know where they fall um, across the entire image and um, I, I actually don't know how equalize works but it does something to to draw out to give um, equal importance to all of the different um, colors represented all the different values in the pixels and that really helps to draw out especially this deep edge here so now I would feel a lot more confident drawing so you know there, there are some dark areas so I might bump this out or come up here and down again um, you know you get the idea and I would keep going and this really draws out the shallow edge a little better too I am there's a an obvious edge here but knowing what we know about eelgrasses, there's often uh, some patchy petering out of, of eelgrass. And I would say these dark signatures are very similar to the dark that I'm seeing in the dense part of the bed. So I feel comfortable coming all the way up, on, but then I'm starting to see some tanner, more tan brown signatures that more closely resemble the rocks that I see on shore. And I'm starting to feel like it's maybe something more like this. I have no idea what's happening under the dock. Um, this area gets a little iffy. Um, perhaps something like that. Any questions on that? There's more examples coming. Okay. So here's an example of a drone image at one to 1000. Again, we would not actually be working um, at this scale, it's too far out. Um, but you can really see sort of the more defined edge and there's really lobes, see these lobes, they kind of come in and out and in and out and there's lots of patches in those lobes and on the outside of them. Um, so when we zoom in a little bit more, one to 500 gets a little more clear. This top is actually a, a imagery from the same spot on a different day, um, but it, it gets a little more clear. And this is the um, scale at which you would actually do the work for the drone work. So Julie, you'll actually be at one to 500 after you're done exploring and looking all around the image. This is where you would start drawing your line. Um, I know at this site that there are rocks with algae in them underwater. They're over here and here. And you can you can see them. They're sort of a darker color. Um, this one actually looks like it's emergent, sticking up out of the water. Uh, maybe over here a little bit too. And then again, somewhere between the bed and the shoreline, there's a transition. So there's there will be dark signatures underwater where there's rocks, but there's a transition between the two. The shallow edge is a whole lot easier than the deep edge across all of the data sets. Um, less less so for sonar because um, that's not dealing with water visibility there. But here's the uh, deep edge of the um, in the drone image from the same site. So you can see it just gets trickier. It gets a lot trickier. Trickier. So you know your goal is to do the best that you can. Don't strain your eyes out of your head and, and just um, try to get your eye used to seeing these different these minor minor differences in color. Sometimes it'll be more questionable. Sometimes the image quality is not perfect. There's like ripples over here, some little waves. That's that's going to happen time and time again. So it's just dealing with it the best that you can and applying the rules the best that you can. So I, I have this example and then I have a couple other examples and I thought it might be nice um, if you want to, if anybody wants to practice annotating using that little cursor, everyone has annotation control. It's um, part of the Zoom control panel. And it's part of why we switched over to, to Zoom too. Um, you, I think you can request annotate. Um, let's see, does that show up? Can anybody let me know if that shows up on their screen? It does, okay. Um, Julie, since this will be your data, do you wanna request annotate and just try, you know, do the, um, the shallow edge and somebody else can try along the, there's, there's no like evaluation or grading of this or anything. It's just to practice a little bit. I have a question um, uh -huh. Julie, for, um, <clears throat> you mentioned this rocky area in the middle um, that I don't know if, yeah, yeah, right there. So would you draw it like excluding this whole kind of lobe that's, that looks like, 
it looks like this it kind of looks like a wart growing out of it this is like a rocky <laughs> signature I don't know if you understand what I mean but would you draw it excluding that or including it yeah that's that's a really good question um fortunately I don't think any of our sites well I'm, I'm actually not sure about that this is this is pretty unique because I don't see eelgrass on the shallow side of this rock um so for this project um if this because we have a distance threshold of 10 meters I think this might be 10 meters right here 10 meters is like um, when you're at the scale it's around an inch or uh, like the size of your finger so if that were 10 <laughs> meters from where you see my cursor to the next nearest eelgrass probably right here I would bridge it and keep going that's how you apply that rule um, if it weren't I would yeah I'd probably go down and around the rock and back up but then when you get to this rock over here there are clear patches um, shallow of you know shoreward of the rock so I would just keep up and shallower because really what we're trying to do is just map the edge we're not trying to get every little undulation and pat you know areas without eelgrass we're just trying to create a single line along the edge so that's where I would you know pop up here and come down up um, that might be one up there I would now exclude the rocks that are up here I don't see unless maybe you guys do I don't see any eelgrass um, shoreward of this pile of rocks so I'd come down and sorry Julia sorry you can continue if you like <laughs> that's okay it's actually sort of hard to do with a touchpad oh yes that makes sense and my cat um, is trying to help which is not helping <laughs> that's pretty darn good for with a touchpad <laughs> um is there a, a um an intern or a grad student uh, who might want to try the the deep edge over here not necessarily from Julie's team from anywhere. Lizzie, you want to give that one a try? You just uh, hit the annotate button. Yeah, I can give it a try. I'm also on a touchpad, so it oh, might no. come out really bad, but I, I'll give it a shot. Um, I hadn't even thought of that. Sorry, guys. But let me, ooh, I actually don't know where to request annotate. Oh. It so in pretty, it's in the top, the top bar, it said view options. And in that drop down menu, it said annotate. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, let me try. Oh, I saw something pop up. Any luck, Lizzie? Oh, there it is. Oh, sorry. It just had a delay. No, you're good. I did it cool. in one shot. Does that like, is that kind of what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's the general idea. I mean, that's, and we'll be, you'll get more training in how to apply those rules, like the 10 meter rule and how to, you know, there's ways of actually measuring it, having a little ruler or something you can use to hold up to the screen and go, oh, like this little lobe here. I'm not sure. This could be 10 meters here. So you would just connect here instead of Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yes, and connect here and possibly connect here. It all depends on if they're if those are 10 meters. But this is exactly the type of thing where you're just going, you know, right along the edge to what you can see. I would have done it okay. just, just like this, more or less. Yep. Um, so that 10 meters rule. So it so I'm not sure if you can see. I'm gonna make a little note. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but like instead it might connect like that instead if you can see what I just yes. said, if yep. it was like less than 10 meters or over 10 meters? If it's less than 10 meters, you could, you make a bridge, you make a bridge. Okay. And if it's over 10 meters, then you go into the lobes. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yep. And then up here, um, so since we, we really want a single line, 
um, along the, the boundary. So I would have actually drawn, I'll change mine to yellow. I probably would have, uh-oh. Well, now my display is in the way. Oh, there we go. Um, oops. Something like, maybe like this. Um, and then over here, I see, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but I do see little patches in here. So my line probably would have been more like going from patch to patch. This is hard. Sorry, guys. <laughs> from patch to patch like that, something like that, so that we have a single boundary line rather than um, trying to delineate individual patches. So Jill, what if we have patches that are more than 10 feet away from the single line boundary? Uh, yeah, those, those can be you know, uh, delineated on their own. Um, so then you would you might have I don't see anything in this image you know if we thought this was eel grass you could have something like this because I would not want you to draw a line that goes up like this and down yeah oh especially that line <laughs> um, does that make sense I I think it's <laughs> I think it's unlikely and we we will we'll practice that too when we're doing the one on one stuff I think it's more likely that you you know kind of have a can visualize a continuous line along the shallow edge. Okay, great. These are these are really good though. Thank you guys. Let's see what was next. Oh, let's clear those. I have a question, Jill. Uh -huh. What if internally inside, like you're delineating the edge, but inside the meadow, there's a big hole that's greater than 10 meters? Nope. You don't make the donut. No, no, we're, yeah, this, I mean, for this, I would love to do that someday, but for this study, it's exclusively the edge, you know, where, where do we draw the edge line? Yep. So even if you, um, uh, I'm going to get out of this. Yeah, so let's see if we have a good exit. This looks to be an isolated, you know, hole in the middle. That's just going to be there. It's going to be part of the meadow in our delineation, but I could see the desire to parse that out. <laughs> yep. So here's um, side scan sonar. Um, Maggie or Allison, if you want to take a crack at this, it's it's if you've never looked at sonar data, it's weird to look at the first time. I get that. These are three different tracks that the boat took. The center line is where the boat traveled. And then it's looking, it's sending sound to 150 feet of either side. So this is about a 300 foot wide swath, a, a picture of the seafloor that's 300 feet wide. That's what you're looking at. And we're at the edge of a meadow. So there's, look again at that texture and um, shadow. You know, we have some shadows from the eelgrass. Something about side scan sonar imagery, the image is not as good directly under the boat. So you could see it's very obviously eelgrass to the left, very obviously eelgrass to the right, looks totally different under the boat, almost like it's gone, but it's still there. You sort of have to interpolate that it's this, that it's uniform underneath the boat, which is a, it's a tricky part of sonar. But I'll just do, I'll do an example first. Um, you know, over here, I would draw um, something like, something like that. And then I would just interpolate all the way over to here and then keep drawing. I don't think, I don't think this is eelgrass here. This is a, a judgment call situation where you might circle that separately um, because that's more than, I think that's more than 10 meters. I'll clear mine. So when we see the images, they will be kind of in a, in a grid, like, like this side by side. So someone else will have pieced them together Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. It'll look like this. We're zoomed pretty far in. We're at one to 500, which is what you'll be using when you actually draw the lines. It, it makes a whole lot more sense when you have the whole map in front of you and you can zoom in and out to do the exploration part and get the lay of the land. It doesn't make a lot of sense when you're just looking at these three pieces of it, though. Yeah. 
Neither of you want to take a crack at the edge here? I will. Cool. So while, while she's doing that, um, of course, when we're actually working with the data, it won't be in PowerPoint or in Zoom. It'll, we won't be doing it like this with an annotate tool. Um, it'll be in a GIS. And I was, um, I'm hoping that we can work in an Esri product, either ArcGIS online. I'm having some trouble. Oh, that looks great. I'm having some trouble getting these super large data sets into ArcGIS online. Uh, it's possible we might have to turn to the desktop tools. So I'll, I'll need to find out from everybody again. And I know I asked a few months ago, again, though, if you have um, ArcMap or ArcPro or QGIS or what you have so that I can, if we need to, I can come and just bring the data on a hard drive and leave that with you to work on your desktop version rather than the online version. We're in a, we're in a modern technology, society, but we still have limitations um, at Mass Bays and CZM for getting these big giant data sets up there. This looks really good, Maggie. I would have I would have done this, I would have done it exactly the same. You know, there, there are some tricky areas that are a little, um, you know, little blips that kind of like I maybe would draw around these little white dots thinking they could possibly be single shoots, you know, very small patches, but in general, I think this is great. All right, clear, oops, clear. What do we have left? Oh, here's a satellite image zoomed way, way out um, to 1.81 to 8,000. This is zoomed in. Randall and your team, this is the hardest data set to work with. Um, it's the lowest resolution. It's very frustrating <laughs> to work with. Um, but the benefit of this is that those raster tools I was talking about where you can manipulate the colors. So this is just the um, true color appearance. You can see a shallow edge here. I can see a deep edge. It's not super obvious and it gets real tricky when you get out here. Um, but if we stretch it using that histogram stretch, it really draws the eelgrass out. But note there are, there's some clouds you know, this is a cloud over here and this is some, or maybe just haze. There's a white blob over here. So there's some amount of, you know, guesswork that you have to do to draw it underneath things like clouds. Um, let me see, where are we at with time? I, since we're, we only have a few minutes left, so I won't have us practice with the annotation on here, but I will, um, I'll send the slides out so that, um, so that Nita and um, where's your other, um, She's still here? And Lizzie, yep. Nita and Lizzie can practice this a, a little bit more too. So um, let me get to our next steps first and then we'll circle back with questions. So we're gonna do one-on-one -on -one trainings um, in September, early to mid-September. I only have my session with Julie scheduled so far. So I need to reach out to the rest of you to figure out when I can come in person and we can sit down and do more practice and we'll get you set up with whatever GIS you're gonna use. Make sure you have all the data and it's, com it's coming into your map okay. We'll do all that stuff. We'll probably take like four or five hours to sit and do all this stuff together. And we'll practice. Um, I'm gonna evaluate how you, you know, like, like we've just done here. I would watch you do, an eva do a um, draw boundary and I'd say, oh, I would have done it a little differently. Let's apply this rule over here and this one over here and so on. And then after that one-on-one -on -one session, then you have a month to interpret the imagery. That's to, to draw all your polygons. And that process is um, two interpreters per uh, partner group. Um, and you should each draw your boundaries independently and then come together and come to an agreement. There will be areas where you disagree, for sure. So that's when you sit together, probably with your lead scientists, um, watching you supervising this process where you agree upon a final line. Sometimes that means splitting the difference between your lines, taking one person's line over the other, for example. So um, you need to have agreement before that product is final. And then that final product is a polygon file. And that's what comes to me and Todd. 
we have a final QAQC. We're not interested in adjusting what you've done and you know picking apart every little detail. We're looking for general general reasonableness at that point. So I don't envision like major changes after at that point. And then we get into analysis and reporting, and that's I can't even think about that right now. But that's like late fall into into late winter. Um, those are our next steps. So I I do need to reach back out. Um, I'll probably do that today, just so I don't forget um, and, and get those one-on-ones scheduled and make sure we've got all the software we need. Um, so now um, we're right at 12, but I am I am happy to, to answer any other questions and stay on as long as anybody needs. Or I can go back to any images or any screens that you like. Is everyone excited? <laughs> Of course. It oh, sounds sure kind am. of relaxing. <laughs> mm -hmm. It kind of is. I'm yeah. Like, oh, I have to just draw some lines for a few hours today. Yeah. <laughs> it's a new meditation practice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Instead of coloring. Right. I kind of love it. And I think there's a lot of um, there's like citizen science potential there too. You know, if you have there's there's programs out there for um like floating forests out of UMass yeah. Boston imagery that that citizen scientists go on and draw polygons around kelp forests and there's so much potential if we could get the imagery down right and you know and know the limitations better to have people just do a quick training and start helping map this resource that is you know problematic with mapping um jill i'm sure we'll talk about this in greater detail in the one-on-ones but what format will we get these images and files in and how exactly will we be drawing on them yeah that's a great question yeah i was initially hoping to have more slides on that going into this um on that actual process but it's i don't know exactly what software we're using yet so i didn't want to spend the time without knowing that um but it'll most likely if it's arc map or arc map pro or arc gis online all of those are very similar um oh bye randall so all of the process is very similar where I bring the data to you on an external hard drive because it's big data. Uh, you just plug that into your machine. Laptops will work fine or a desktop, but you, you plug that in um, and open ArcMap. You just pull, the data will be ready to pull in. So you literally like drag it into your map. It pops up and then I will walk you through the process of creating a new layer. So you need to make a new mm -hmm. polygon file and then you start editing the polygon file and that's when you draw you know the actual boundary cool yeah but we'll we'll walk through all that it's it's really straightforward i was really hoping everything could be done in arcjs online since it's instant sharing and you know we could review each other's work easily and all that but it might not work out are you looking for the same for all the the different um you know um for every team or would you do online with one team say like and then not something else with someone else yeah it depends what everyone has um so if i'm it would be nice to standardize that and just use desktop across the board but um not everyone might have that so uh so we can mix and match but if i know that um you know for you for you for example if you only had arcjs online i would spend all that time getting the data into ArcGIS online just for your data set for side scan sonar and not try to put these giant satellite images and drone images in there, um, for example. So I'm I'm totally fine with mixing and matching. And also if we had to, you know, if people are having hardware issues, I have a, my own personal laptop with our map on it that I could share out if needed. And, you know, we've just got, we've got options, but I do need to find out what everybody has. <laughs> When when are you going to be reaching out to uh, each of the groups? What's what's your goal to have everything scheduled by end of next week or? Yeah, I mean, I'll email you today just um, just to make sure it's out there. But I would love to schedule it for the first two weeks of September. So a date in the first two weeks of September where you're, the whole team will be there and can um, go through the training. And then you have once from a month after that point, you've got that whole month to to work up the data. I have to scoot too, but thank you, Jill. This is awesome. Thanks, Maggie.
Yeah, I'm excited. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, and if there's anything else, just um, shoot me an email or give me a call or, or whatever. I'm really excited to get into this next phase. Yeah, looking forward to it and a really good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Jill. Right. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Bye.